Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to talk about the power of visualization, particularly through the lens of Harold Sherman. We've covered Harold Sherman in previous episodes, but he was an amazing writer who wrote some fiction as well and was a salesman, but had this vibrant way of writing. He's talked about intuition. The episode on hunches was really good. He wrote a book about sending thoughts to someone else, this amazing experiment. And also, he was somewhat at the very beginning of the Urantia movement, which I recently found out. But this one focuses on the power of visualization with some great examples coming from his book, Know Your Own Mind, an amazing revelation of your inner consciousness. We have certainly talked about visualization a number of times on the channel, but we can never have too much information. Visualization is the most amazing power, and anybody that's become an expert on it, I want to know everything that they do, because sometimes you'll get new bits of information on how to visualize properly, and it is a powerful and effective skill, especially as we move into fourth density. When we visualize something, it will come to pass if we visualize it in the appropriate way. The Power of Visualization by Harold Sherman. When you plan something in advance that you hope to accomplish, you are actually creating that something in your mind. It will ultimately be just as perfected in consciousness as your past accumulated experience and acquired ability applied to this objective can make it. The creative power within can only help materialize for you in your outer world what you have built for yourself in your inner world. Basically, you must earn through your own physical, mental, and spiritual effort whatever comes to you in life. This does not mean that your accomplishments will necessarily be well-balanced or proportioned. You may possess what many term a money sense and operate the powers of visualization effectively in this field and yet operate very ineffectively on the plane of health, domestic relations, and other vital phases of your life. Each human has some blind spots in consciousness wherein his own mental and emotional reactions like attracting like are continuing to bring him wrong conditions and happenings. This can only be corrected by discovery of the cause and its removal, through elimination of the thoughts and feelings which have created it. The God power within always helps when called upon but never dictates. In seeking guidance of the God consciousness when you are visualizing what you desire to achieve, you must not try to force it. So many humans are so over-anxious to be led to do the right thing, to move in the right direction, to say the right thing, to see the right person, that they emotionally excite their imagination to produce ideas for them, which in their overzealous state, they mistakenly interpret as originating from the God power within. Acting impulsively upon these self-created urges, they often come to grief and suffer a loss of faith in God and in themselves, afraid to follow what they thought had been their inner guidance from then on, feeling desperate, bewildered, and alone. Actually, these distraught humans with every good intention had been trying to tell the God power within what they themselves most wanted to hear, glossing over in many instances their own weaknesses and inabilities which would have to be corrected by their own efforts before God could help them on the level of their desires. Had their attitude been less assertive and demanding, and had they asked that they might be shown what they needed to develop in their lives, what lack existed in them which had attracted a corresponding lack without, God would have spoken. The desire for self-illumination would have cut through the level of imagination and reached up to the level of God consciousness. It is difficult when one is under economic and other emotional pressures to assume and maintain an impersonal point of view, detached enough to see clearly your own possible mistakes and shortcomings which have been producing the very conditions from which you seek deliverance. Faced with the problem which seems beyond you, and desiring help from the God power within, 
you should concentrate during your meditation period upon composing your own mind and emotions, putting aside your fears and apprehensions, and exercising the faith that when you have opened up the channels of your innermost being, the unmistakable answer to your prayers will flood your consciousness. Do not try to compel this answer to come at any specific time because the God consciousness does not operate within the time limitations of earth. Your faith that you will know what is best to do at the time that is best for you in relation to all other factors involved in your problem will free the God power to enter your life experience in a way that will be most helpful to you. Although you cannot sit down and wait for God to do things for you, it is wise to get off by yourself, take inventory, and see if you may not be doing things which are making it impossible for God to do anything for you. The instant you see yourself in your own mind's eye starting off on a new project, involving other people and things, your thoughts make subconscious contact with all points visualized. It may take days or weeks before you make actual contact with these persons and things pictured, but they all exist in consciousness during your planning period just as realistically as though you had been in touch with them and if your thinking with relation to them has been correct and constructive, you will at the proper time attract their association and cooperation to the end that what you have visualized and worked toward becomes an accomplished fact. A few personal experiences will serve to illustrate. In the middle 1930s, the idea came to me that I might dramatize for radio stage and screen the life of America's great humorist, Mark Twain. Inquiry revealed that the rights to do this would have to be secured through the Mark Twain estate, which had been established following Twain's death for the purpose of handling the sale and other business relative to his many literary properties. I found that this estate was managed by an attorney, Charles T. Lark, with office on Fifth Avenue, that he was one of the trustees and that he had been the lawyer who had drawn up Twain's will and acted as his executor. The estate was being operated for Mark Twain's only surviving daughter at that time, Mrs. Ossip Gabrilowicz of Detroit. I realized that my ambition to dramatize Mark Twain's life could not be achieved unless I was willing to invest my time and talent in preparation of a full and complete synopsis which might be presented to Mr. Lark in proof of my ability. It was evident that many writers of far greater reputation than mine had sought and were seeking the granting of these same valuable rights. I reasoned that these busy writers would perhaps not be willing nor have the time to prepare any material on speculation, but would request these rights of the estate based upon their established reputations. I therefore decided it was worth the gamble for me to devote all the time possible in a study of all writings on, about, and by Mark Twain, to saturate my consciousness with his life activities and character, and then to prepare a detailed dramatic outline to show the estate just how I would propose to handle the subject for the stage. In preparing this work, which required about six months, I constantly pictured in my mind its acceptance by Mr. Lark and all concerned. When submitted, my conscious mind tried to suggest at times that I didn't have the ghost of a chance in competition with big-name authors, that I was wasting my time, and that I was letting myself in for a major disappointment. Intuitively, however, I felt that this project would succeed because I had a profound feeling of kinship for Mark Twain, who in his day had recognizably used these same powers of extrasensory perception. I hoped that Mr. Lark and Clara Clemens Gavrilovich and Albert Bigelow Payne, Twain's official biographer, who was then still living, would sense in the reading of my outline that my interest in Twain was not motivated by opportunism, but by a deep conviction that my background and understanding could bring Twain to life in dramatic form. When the outline was finally finished, I had it professionally typed and bound out. With that, I was now ready to make contact with Charles T. Lark for the first time. I phoned his office and made an appointment through his secretary. The night before keeping his appointment in my period of meditation, I had what you might call an imaginary interview with Mr. Lark. I saw myself meeting and informing him of the purpose of my visit. I heard Mr. Lark explain politely to me that the estate placed a high value 
upon the dramatic rights to Mark Twain's life and had turned down many offers and requests from authors. This information was not intuitive. It had been public knowledge. But as I visualized my interviews with Mr. Lark, I felt that he at least he could say or do in appreciation of the time and labor I had put upon the script would be to say that he would read it. If I could get him to agree to this much, in my first contact I felt that this would be all that I could possibly expect. During this meditation, a definite feeling came to me that Mr. Lark would agree to read the outline, and the instant I had this impression I relaxed and went to sleep in the faith that all would go well with my appointment. Everything did turn out exactly as visualized. Mr. Lark was much impressed by the enormous amount of work I had done on speculation, realizing, as I pointed out to him, that if he did not find my work acceptable, all he had to do was drop the manuscript in the wastebasket since I did not possess the rights and could go no further without legal sanction of the estate. The copyright laws are such that while much of an author's writing and life may be in the public domain after his death, and following the expiration of his copyrights as long as any living relatives remain who require dramatization as a part of any story, permission must be obtained from them or their estate for inclusion. In this case, Clara Clemens Gabrilowicz, as one of Twain's daughters, was to appear in several scenes. Mr. Lark said frankly that he could give me no assurance whatsoever that all his work I had done would find favor with the estate. He showed me a file of letters and telegrams from famous authors and producers seeking these same rights. He said that Mrs. Gabrilowicz wanted to make sure that her father's life would be tastefully and sympathetically dramatized and she did not wish to enter into any contract for such dramatization until she knew exactly how the playwright proposed to treat this subject. I left Mr. Lark's office with a light heart and a growing conviction that acceptance of my outline would be only a matter of time. The waiting periods on any project are the hardest to endure. When you have done all you can and the results are, as they say, in the laps of the gods, having no word on how things are going, your conscious mind often upsets you by its fears and doubts and apprehensions. Since your conscious mind in itself has only the five physical senses to depend upon, it will try to impress you with the mathematical chances against success and all the human factors which might go wrong or rise up in opposition to a venture. I had my bad moments but found assurance in the meditation periods when, with the conscious mind's influence blocked out, my extrasensory feelings told me that what I desired would come to pass. In about ten days, Mr. Lark's secretary phoned and asked me to mail to the office a copy of my bibliography. I knew from this that my outline was receiving serious consideration. Two weeks later, Mr. Lark himself called and invited me to lunch. He then reported that he had read the outline and had liked it so much he had mailed it on to the other trustees in Albert Bigelow Payne, and when he had received favorable replies from them, he sent the script to Mrs. Gabrilowicz. She too had written expressing her liking for the overall treatment, and I suppose now, concluded Mr. Lark, what you want is the go-ahead. I told him it certainly was that I desired to work in close association with the estate in the dramatization, and after some discussion, the contract was agreed upon, granting me the exclusive rights in all dramatic forms. Further evidence that much can be accomplished in and through consciousness, which leads eventually to its materialization in actual life, is demonstrated in this experience. I have been writing regularly for Boy's Life, the official Boy Scout publication, for a number of years. Finally, I arrived at the point where I felt I had earned higher remuneration for my stories. Although the magazine was then paying me the top price allowed by its budget, I knew that my request for a raise would require a strategic approach in my friendly relations with Franklin K. Matthews, editor. I therefore decided to discuss my case mentally with him as though he were actually present. I felt this would help me in talking personally to him later, so I sat down in my study and pictured myself in the presence of Mr. Matthews submitting my reasons for believing I was worth more to the publication than it was paying me. I told Mr. Matthäus just exactly how much more I thought I should receive for each story. I seemed to hear him raising certain objections and explaining why the publication could not go higher. 
After further discussion, however, he seemed to concede that I was worth the amount I had proposed and said he would go before the budget board and see if he could make a special arrangement in my case. The moment I sensed that Mr. Matthews had reached this decision, I thanked him for his consideration and then dismissed the mental interview from consciousness so that I would not reflect upon it with my conscious mind and give it a chance to undo with its doubts and fears what had now been accomplished by my subconscious. It had been my intention to make an appointment with Mr. Matthews to talk over this matter in the next few days, but each time I thought about it, I couldn't get the urge to take the initiative. While I was waiting for the right impulse, Mr. Matthews' secretary phoned me. She said the editor was going to Florida and wanted to see me. Would I call at his hotel that afternoon? I did so and was greeted by Mr. Matthews with the statement that he had recently been reviewing the work I had done for Boy's Life, that he felt I was worth more money to them, and he had arranged with the board for me to get it. Then, in asking if a certain raise would be acceptable to me, he named the very amount I had proposed in my mental interviews. It is occasionally possible to visualize for other people and to transmit thoughts which may reinforce or help change and strengthen their own mental and emotional attitudes. This is most effectively done during sleep. Children who have developed bad habits can often be reached in this manner. Sitting quietly by the bedside, after they have dropped asleep, you can speak in a low voice, suggesting right conduct to them in a way to appeal to their sense of logic and liking, which thoughts will be received and put into operation by their subconscious. Mrs. Sherman aided one of our daughters in overcoming the habit of thumb-sucking by this method when every conscious attempt, such as reprimands, painting the thumb with bitter solutions, and even bandaging it, had failed. This daughter was told during sleep that she was changing the shape of her mouth by her thumb-sucking, and she didn't want to do that because it was making her mouth unattractive. Response the next day was immediate and positive, as has been the response in many similar cases of self-help through suggestion. Men and women who have a deep bond of sympathy and understanding between each other can be of mutual assistance in visualizing the successful attainment of their respective desires. It is vitalizing for any person to know that some trusted friend or loved one shares this faith in himself and the God power within. There is no limit to the power of visualization if supported by proper faith and the willingness to earn, through your own efforts, what you desire to achieve. Perhaps the severest test of faith I've yet had in my life came to me in the year 1935. i have been called in by the radio director of a large advertising agency to revise the format of a then-famous musical show on the air. It was explained to me that within the next several months, streamlining of the entire program was to be made, and he wished me to prepare an outline for the new show and write the scripts. He stated that he could not give me a contract until the time should arrive for the changeover and the present writers and actors who were to be released were freed of their contracts. I foolishly accepted his proposal and went to work without even a letter agreement. Anticipating a lucrative engagement, I turned down other promising offers during this period, but when time came for my contract to be made, higher powers in the agency moved in, my ideas were given to other writers, and I sat at home listening to my material presented in revised form go on the air. A theatrical attorney told me that I could sue and probably collect at least 13 weeks compensation, but he also advised that this case could be delayed in the courts and cause me more grief than it was worth despite the losses I had sustained as a result of this duplicity. Several other ventures upon which I had put a great amount of work also failed to materialize during this period, which culminated in our being compelled to leave our apartment Although I had a good understanding of the operation of mind and emotions at the time, I found it impossible to prevent a venomous resentment rising up within me against this radio director who had preyed upon my time and talent so ruthlessly and caused me, as a consequence, such punishing economic embarrassment. This is the closest I have ever come to having murder in my heart for any human, but I paid dearly for my emotional disturbance. One morning, I awakened with a strange smarting sensation spread over the membranes of my throat. Upon examination, I saw a white cauliflower-like growth extending from the back of my tongue over the sides of my throat and down over the tonsil areas. I could tell at once that this was some unusual affliction 
and went immediately to my doctor who, never having seen this throat condition before, nevertheless diagnosed it as correctly as a mycosis. He gave me the grim information that there was no known specific cure and advised that I take the train at once to Philadelphia to consult one of the world's greatest throat specialists. My doctor stated that the history of such cases revealed this parasitical fungus growth to be most virulent, that within a few months' time it could close the throat or extend into the ears, causing mastoids or go into the lungs, any one of these developments, of course, causing death. At Philadelphia, cultures were taken for testing in the laboratory, but nothing was done for 10 days except as I was rolled back and forth to the operating room for examination by different new doctors who studied these fungus growths through the bronchoscope and remarked, how interesting. I later learned that outstanding throat specialists had been notified of this rare fungus growth and had flown in from other parts of the country just to have a look at it. At the end of these 10 days, I was called into a famous specialist office and informed that I could now return home to the care of my family physician. This was a bit difficult for me to understand since the fungus growth was still there. In fact, had become extended to within a quarter inch of the windpipe, but I was informed that my family physician had been given instructions for my treatment. Arriving back in New York, I went directly to my doctor's office. He was surprised to see me and asked my condition and what had been done for me. I told him that insofar as I could see, no treatment had been administered, and then I asked, haven't you heard from this specialist? He said he had written you. My doctor shook his head. No, he said, I've had no word as yet. Let's have a look at your throat. At about this moment, the postman came in with the morning mail, which contained the promised letter. My doctor read it soberly and then passed it on to me. The specialist began by congratulating the physician for having to correctly diagnose the unusual mycosis. He then went on to state that they had been experimenting with cultures but had found nothing that had proved effective against them. The remainder of the letter reading between the lines was a polite return of the patient to die in the care of his family's physician. When I had finished reading the letter, I turned to my doctor and said, well, where do we go from here? He said, Harold, I've been making a study of these mycosis conditions while you were gone, and I know, as a chemist, that arsenic will kill both animal and vegetable life. Since this fungus growth is comprised of both, which accounts for its unusual virulence, most treatments that might work against one will usually not work against the other. So with your permission, I propose to attack this parasitical fungus growth through your bloodstream by injections of arsenic. By this method, I hope to check its spread and eventually kill it off. However, this is frankly experimental and has been tried on a human with respect to this mycosis. It may not work. I considered a moment, but something told me to go ahead. I said, it sounds good to me. I apparently don't have much choice. We've got to try something. From then on, the battle began. Three times a week, I was at the doctor's first patient in the morning and his last patient in the afternoon. He filled my bloodstream as full as arsenic as he dared, and the fungus growth didn't like it. It commenced to retreat under the poisonous onslaught. It had been caked on my tongue almost half an inch high in spots, quite solidly down the sides of my throat dangerously close to the windpipe but in a few months time under the arsenic attack this growth was reduced to two spots each about the size of a dime directly over the area where my tonsils had been prior to an operation years before by this time i had taken so much arsenic into my system that the doctor was afraid its continued injections would injure other organs of my body he said to me one day I think we'll do without these injections for a few weeks. Perhaps your body has now developed enough resistance to clear up this mycosis without any more arsenic. We tried it, and within a short time the fungus growth began spreading like a prairie fire. I realized then that I was facing perhaps the greatest crisis of all. It had been proved that arsenic could check and control the growth of this fungus. If it couldn't completely eliminate it, this meant that I appeared doomed to resume my arsenic injections in order to keep the mycosis from ultimately winning out. It meant also that I must continue to endure the arsenic headaches, which were so severe that I could hardly see and made any mental work next to impossible. However, I had no choice. I had to return to arsenic to save my life. For just a moment, now permit me to go back in time 
and give you an account of my emotional reaction to the realization that I had contracted this rare and unusual malady. The first few days I was assailed by fear and apprehension. I had examined medical books and the unhappy pictures of men and women who had been afflicted with the same fungus growth, which in a few months' time, uncontrolled, had closed off their windpipes, bringing about suffocation. No operations were possible because the presence of the mycosis in the bloodstream would mean death. The medical records showed that some 40 known cases in the past 50 years all had succumbed. It was understandably difficult for me to lift my mind above such a realistic percentage against me. I had a wife and two daughters and other family responsibilities and was in no economic condition to leave them with any security. But aside from all this, which bore heavily upon me, I had a tremendous desire and will to live. For the first few nights when I entered upon my meditation periods, I found it impossible to concentrate or control my feelings. Fear took over and caused me to see nightmarish pictures of myself awakening in some future moment. Coughing and choking with the realization that the growth had reached my windpipe and that my life was soon to be cut short. Coupled with these fears, I discovered that an intense and burning hatred of the radio director had started my cycle of misfortune. Then suddenly, as I fought to gain control of my emotions, it came over me with devastating conviction that my hate for this man had so filled my system with poison that it had changed the chemistry of my body and made it susceptible to the contraction of this fungus of growth, which otherwise would probably have never been attracted to me. I recalled my doctor having asked on my first visit if I had recently eaten any moldy bread. It so happened that Mrs. Sherman had discovered mold on a loaf of bread we had partially eaten several days before and had thrown the remainder away. The doctor explained that many humans are taking molds of one kind or another into their bodies every day, but this usually has no effect upon the organism. In my case, for some strange reason, the fungus had taken hold. After this reflection, I was convinced that I knew the reason that I had set up the cause of my affliction within myself, that I would have to aid medical science as much as I humanly could by striving to eliminate from my mind and my body the destructive effects of my own thinking and feeling. I should have to stop picturing my conditions as hopeless and each meditation period I would need to work on myself in an effort to remove the deep-seated feelings of bitterness toward this radio director. Gradually, as I regained my mental perspective, I could see that I basically had my own self to blame not the man for the advantage he had taken of me. This did not excuse his weakness and dishonesty, but if I had employed good business sense in demanding a letter of agreement so it would not have been my word against his, I would have had something in writing to show for my work and he would have been compelled to treat me fairly. The shifting of the blame from my unhappy experience helped me to develop in time a forgiving attitude toward him and even incredibly a degree of goodwill. But in addition to this, as I considered my own serious physical condition, I felt that I must do something to combat the recurrence of fear, which lurked in the background of consciousness at all times. One evening there came to me a period of meditation from some extrasensory source, a strong feeling. There was somewhere in this world an individual who knew a specific remedy for this form of mycosis. It was almost as though I had made a subconscious contact with this person in my need. My problem if this impression was true, was to find that individual to be drawn to him or he to me. A great surge of hope rose up in my consciousness. I thought if I can free my mind of hate and fear and other destructive feelings, then I will be able to picture instead with faith and confidence that I will meet someone sometime somewhere who will know a specific cure for this mycosis in time to save my life. Once I decided upon this visualization, it became almost an obsession with me. I lived in the constant expectation of meeting this individual. It was my last visualization at night and my first on awakening. I did not try to force it. I kept repeating, in time to save my life, and felt the God power within you would synchronize my movements in time and eventually bring what I had pictured to pass. This persistent faith buoyed me up through all the setbacks and trying months that followed and even when I was confronted with the necessity of having more arsenic injections to keep this fungus growth confined to the tonsil area I still felt unexplainably that release was going to come in all the time 
I had been combating this affliction. I had kept the knowledge of it from even my closest friends. There was nothing external to indicate that I was in any trouble aside from the necessity for me to clear my throat quite often. It was my feeling that if the news should get around that I was suffering from this fungus growth, which was supposed to be incurable, and if my friends accepted the concept that I might not be long for this world, I would have to fight their negative thinking along with my own. Consequently, only my wife, mother, and doctor knew what I was undergoing. One day, Sidney Est, a friend who shared my interest in metaphysical subjects, asked if Mrs. Sherman and I would like to attend a lecture to be given by Dr. A. E. Strath Gordon on the Great Pyramid of Egypt. He told me that Dr. Strath Gordon had been a brain surgeon for the British government during the World War and that he had served on a commission in the early 1900s which had entered and studied the Great Pyramid. He attended the lecture and found the talk of great interest, but Dr. Strath Gordon even more so. I felt strongly drawn to him for some reason and st- stayed to meet him afterwards, inviting him on impulse to lunch with me at the city club the following day. When we met over the dining table, I was eager to discuss many subjects with him, but had a spell wherein I was compelled to clear my throat several times. Dr. Strath Gordon observed me quietly and remarked, you appear to be having a little trouble with your throat. Heretofore, if someone had made such a comment, I had brushed it aside, but now I felt the urge to confide the difficulty I had been having to this new friend. He showed immediate interest and requested that I give him the history of my case and the condition of my throat at the present time. I told him that thanks to the arsenic, this fungus growth had again been limited to two small areas where my tonsils had been, but was so deeply rooted to the membranes at these points that it had resisted all attempts to dislodge it. Dr. Strath Gordon said, do you have pencil and paper? Wonderingly, I produced a pencil and the back of an envelope. Take down this prescription, he directed, and then commence to dictate the ingredients. So many parts of creosote and so many parts of glycerin, so many parts of this and that. When I had finished copying, I looked up at him and asked, Just what is this prescription, doctor? It is specific for you and your type of mycosis, he said, simply. But how? Where did you get it? I wanted to know almost unbelievingly. Years ago, said Dr. Strathcordon, I was sent by the British government to work with Noguchi, the famous Japanese scientist in South Africa. While I was there, this mycosis, which thrives in hot, humid climates, became epidemic and the natives were dying like flies. Noguchi developed this solution, and if it was applied before the fungus growth became too extensive, it saved their lives. I was like a man emerging from a dream. Here at last, seated across from me, was the person I had visualized meeting all these weeks. Someone who knew a specific cure for my ailment. My extrasensory perception had been right. There had been an individual who carried the knowledge of a cure in his consciousness. And I had finally been drawn to him out of all the human beings in this country. Doctor, I said, Do you mind if we cut short our visit at this time? I would like to take this prescription at once to my doctor and try it out. By all means, Sherman, smiled Dr. Strathcordon. We can meet again some other time. I took a taxi to my doctor's office, related the remarkable circumstances which had placed this prescription in my hands, and asked him what we should do about it. Get the prescription filled at the nearest drugstore, he said. When I returned, my doctor took an applicator saturated with solution and swabbed my throat over the affected areas. There was a stinging sensation. The remaining growth shriveled up and dropped off, and it was cured. You can increasingly understand, I'm sure, why I believe so deeply in the power of visualization. If you will check back in your own life, you will discover that it has been of equal service to you, perhaps, without your conscious realization, because everything that happens to you has to have had its origin in your mind. You can learn to employ the power of visualization even more effectively if you will conscientiously follow the practices I have herein outlined. Every successful man and woman has been a positive visualizer. What problem are you facing today? What unrealized aspiration do you have? Start picturing what you want and need. Repeat this visualization over and over, day after day, with faith in the God power within and faith in your own efforts persist and fulfillment 
must eventually come. I chose this chapter because I was inspired by the story that Sherman had to tell. In particular, the story about his fungus. I had a friend recently that got sick of a mild form of cancer and just gave up. Just gave up. They assumed that they were gone and in very little time they had passed. And I had done research and studied on it and there were ways to deal with this particular cancer. And if he had only just visualized a way of dealing with it. Sometimes when we have miraculous thinking, we don't take it to the next level. We say, we imagine that the fungus were to go away, but he imagined somebody who had a cure for him. That way, in his own mind, he could believe in the cure. There's some unique aspects to his form of visualization that are important. As we have discussed in previous episodes that have been shown by the Neville Goddard material, and in fact, in the book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy, he tells a similar story of somebody that had a hateful situation going on with the ex-husband, and it made them sick. Oftentimes, if you find yourself sick, start to go back and see, are there somebody in your life that you're holding resentments against, hatred against, that you haven't forgiven? In my own case, I was struggling to sell an old property that I had to sell, and it's taken forever, and nobody would buy it. It was a commercial property. And my sister just said, hey, there's something you're not forgiving. And I went deep, and there were some things I wasn't even aware of. I thought that I had forgiven everything. But there were some things that had been blocking me that I had not forgiven. And I made it a point to really out loud forgive and go through the processes and techniques that are discussed in many of my episodes. But I visualized that forgiveness as well. And I visualized and let go of it. And I was able to sell the property almost the next day. So the examples given here are great. Visualization for many people is difficult because they can't see the pictures in their mind. But remember, you can hear things, you can feel things. Give yourself credit. You've been visualizing your whole life and you can do it. It's easier than you think. If you visualize your reality, it will come to pass. Continue to do this. Notice that sleep is very important here. He does the visualizing right before he goes to bed and when he wakes up. Repetition is good, but also notice that he says that he has a feeling come over him. It's a click. We've talked about it in the episode on magnetizing the thing you want. There's a click that happens when you start visualizing or imagining the thing that you want. There's a feeling that comes over you. It is very unique, but I've noticed a lot of people have something too. And that's when you know it's working. This click, this thing that happens, this feeling, sometimes it's in the heart or the solar plexus. So I would love it if you could share in the comments your own stories of things you visualize that have come to pass for healings, for a variety of different subjects. The more that we hear success stories, the more that we believe in these things and have faith when we attempt to apply these techniques. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. Mm-hmm.